Musicology Tonight is made possible by scholars like you. Click the link in the comments to contribute to this public musicology. Hi, I'm Sam and welcome to Musicology Tonight, a review for comprehensive exams in music studies. In our last episode, we read Joseph Kerman's Cold War account of the musicology department. He described how it had historically overemphasized positivism, a philosophy which values verifiable facts. Rather, he argued, musicologists should turn to criticism to justify their claims. That same year, in 1985, Margaret Bent was elected president of AMS. Bent was a staunch defender of the older empirical model, and the stage was set for a battle for the field. During the next decade, musicology would experience a revolution in the shape of new musicology. The next generation of scholars waged a war of letters against the seemingly ironclad armor of empirical musicology. And I mean, how do you argue against facts? Tonight, we fast forward almost 40 years to the second edition of Nicholas Cook's introductory textbook, Music, a very short introduction. In this book, Cook argues that musical cultures are defined by the active ways they construct sound and that thinking in music is the combination of the many modes of music existence, a sort of interconnection of all kinds of musicking, to borrow from musicologist Christopher Small. To Cook, the problem seems to be that, though we are very interested in describing these cultural products and practices, especially from within a social framework, actually describing the experience of music can feel similar to describing a dream. While this is more or less the same with other senses, like describing the taste of wine and the smell of perfume, Cook asks, why do we prize musical description, thinking in music, above others, despite the difficulty? Cook also notes that the word classical has several meanings. The large C classical music refers to the relatively short period of Viennese music, whose history is centered on the music of Haydn, Mozart, and Beethoven. The little C classical music is the more recent 20th century fan culture, which shaped the history of music into a single volume story, a story which unfortunately ignored the musical legacies right outside its doors. There is one more C covered in this book, that of classical music's intersection with larger geopolitical histories of colonialism. Cook's idea of thinking in music describes the asymmetric power structures that have shaped the way our global culture thinks in music, as well as the smaller group of musicians who make up the American university system's music departments. As we saw in Kerman, 1985, in a strange way, the focus of musicology has historically been on particular works of music rather than on biographical facts surrounding the people who wrote them. In this book, Cook steps back from that project, taking an anthropological look at how the particular musical world we inhabit was fashioned, as well as its relationship to contemporary culture and society. Compared to Kerman's survey of the field, Cook addresses many of the systemic issues that have troubled classical music's legacy. How does Cook navigate these deep waters? Let's find out on the timeline. Cook's timeline for European classical music begins in the 1600s, exploring the development of staff notation. In the 1700s, the chorale, instrumental, and operatic repertoires became standardized and shared a growing lexicon of musical characters, often scripted from the opera. Cook cast the 1800s as an era of myth-making and monumentalization, centering on the epitome of genius Ludwig van Beethoven. These myths and monuments were signposts for a burgeoning and professionalizing middle class who quickly historicized their musical legacy. Cook also notes points of intersection in classical music's colonial history, as the 1700s saw a massive shift in resources, both cultural and capital, which created a sense of the universality of European music often justified using pseudoscientific principles. For example, as Europe in the late 1800s experienced a trend of Orientalism, later in the 1900s, East Asia went through a musical modernization, integrating local folk traditions into the new classical framework. During this time in the States, jazz became a site of cultural negotiation, bringing together disparate elements such as the slave holler, the blues, and modernist harmony. These musical cultures were shut out of the university, however, as Cook describes a mid-20th century standardization of style, fueled by the products of the Industrial Revolution, the phonograph, talking films, radio, and television. Recordings offered a new way to experience and conceive of time and space, 
as it brought the opera, the jazz club, and the new avant-garde electronic music into the public's home. The price for the new global celebrity was a sense of authenticity. The cost of this intimacy was a sense of ownership by the public. Cook uses the example of the backlash that folk singer Bob Dylan experienced going electric in the late 1960s. The jam session offered American musicians a space to explore and express their own musical identity in real time for the audience. The late 20th century's explosion of globalization and technology combined to intensify the sense of music's virtual irreality. While classical music saw itself in its twilight, arena shows brought together crowds of undreamed size, and digital stores like iTunes provided users with a labyrinth of musical libraries. Furthermore, artists like Beyonce and Radiohead transformed the digital music landscape with innovative release mediums and formats. To describe this process of thinking in music, Cook explores competing theories of knowledge, such as naturalism and idealism, sometimes called epistemologies. He touches on Carl Seeger's idea of the musicological juncture, the strange relationship between music's seemingly complex design compared to the ease of its intelligibility. Cook also illuminates the gray area between process and product through a comparison of the compositional practices in jazz and classical music. Cook's focus in this book is epistemology, the study of knowledge, and he casts musicology as the mental knowledge of music as compared to the embodied knowledge of performance. Cook elegantly describes music as artifice that passes itself off as nature. The idea of music as natural is caught up in the larger philosophy of naturalism, in which all possible knowledge of the universe falls within the pale of scientific investigation. Compare this to idealism, the theory that our understanding of objects is limited to our mental experience of them. Cook cites the ethnomusicologist Charles Seeger, who coined the term musicological juncture to describe the sense that music needs no apparent effort to be understood. It just seems natural. But then, as Cook notes, all human artifice seems natural to some degree. Cook's concept of thinking in music combines aspects of performance and analysis. He argues that music is very abstract, and that we use our instruments and notations to help us get a grip on the music in our mind and manipulate it through our imagination. This embodied in the moment relationship to music is reinforced by the musical instruments we play. The mental schemes we create while playing also help to internalize the spatial layout of these instruments and can even influence how we individually relate to the same music. Contrasted to the more bureaucratic and product-oriented model of classical music, the idea of music as a process focuses on the artistic activity which surrounds individual works of art. To illustrate this difference, Cook contrasts improvisation to the performance of a written work, using jazz and classical music as examples, with jazz being described as more actively oriented. Cook builds on the philosopher Maurice Merleau-Ponty's insight that composition is a process, pointing out the paradoxical ease of music's experience compared to the intense labor needed to produce it. Cook uses his own experience, reconstructing the sketches for Beethoven's unfinished sixth piano concerto as an example. These sketches provide partial images of Beethoven's changing perspectives, the sum of which leads to a more complete conception of what Cook calls the composer's compositional ecology, a sort of network of work, and offers an alternative to the 19th century myth of the flash of genius. And that's all they wrote. The new edition of Music, a very short introduction, was just published and hasn't been reviewed yet, but I enjoyed reading it. As always, please engage with me in the comments. Feel free to correct me, add your own thoughts, recollections, and experiences. Don't forget to like this video and subscribe to the channel. This is a public musicology. Next time on Musicology Tonight, join us for a penetrating look into the inner workings of the professor's mind and discover the answer to these exciting questions. Why does curricular reform take so long? Why does a faculty of iconoclasts all think the same? Whom does the university serve and why? For the answers to all these questions and more, join us next time on Musicology Tonight!